We're uh, going to jump into the series, Zeke Speaks, in 2019 in just a minute. But I had an announcement that I forgot to tell Steve. So I'm making it myself. It's about summer camp. We go to summer camp in the Bronx, New York. That's what we do. Some people may go other places. We go to the Bronx, right? And uh, so uh, the time that we're going to do that this summer is uh, the second week in July. It's the second week in July. It's the uh, week, and I wrote it down, you know, so remember, it starts July the 7th. It's when we're going to start. Now then, Kimberly Ball, drum roll, oh, drummer's gone, uh, yeah, Kimberly is going to help us with all the logistics about finding a place and going and stuff. So we need to talk to, talk to Kimberly if you're interested in going. If that's a problem, you want to go, but you can't go then, tell us then too, and we'll figure out something. Uh, we'll sneak in someone else's suitcases on a different week than we're supposed to go. But uh, it's a great thing we've done. Uh, I'm going to be there looking forward to joining a bunch of you in the Bronx, New York, on Sunday, July the 7th, and that following week. And so if you have some more information that you want to give to Kimberly, please do that. Uh, she'll be emailing all of us about some other things we need to know. Uh, and so just be ready for that, okay? Also, some of you were here last week and saw the great skit that was performed by myself uh, and, you know, also Emily and Georgie. I want to say mostly it was me, but no, nah, probably not. So uh, anyway, there's going to be a, a little bit part two of that today. So I want everybody to be look forward to that. It's, gonna, it's getting ready to be happening. We're, we're in the book of Ezekiel, and it's probably maybe not the worn out part of your Bible. Uh, I don't know. Maybe you've underlined and highlighted a bunch in Ezekiel, but maybe not. But uh, it's after Psalms. It's before Matthew. Okay, so kind of with that parameters, start to start narrowing down. We're going to be in chapter 33 today, very specifically chapter 33. Next week, if you want to kind of get ready, next week we're going to be in chapter 34. Amazing. Sometimes we don't go in order. Sometimes we skip over a bunch of stuff. Sometimes we go back, but this, this time we're going boom, boom, just like that. Uh, last week was pretty significant uh, about the fall of Jerusalem, and I appreciate so much Danny's thoughts today. And in a sense, Danny, they fit today as the great kind of reminder about what we talked about last week, which is really helpful, I think. Because uh, I'm a guy that likes a little bit of continuity. I know some of you, it's like, what? We're in Ezekiel? I didn't know that. <laughs> That's okay. That's okay, too. Uh, God's speaking in so many different, different ways here. So the fall of Jerusalem is what we talked about last week. And for those of you, I'm going to summarize in just one sentence, okay? The fall of Jerusalem represents whatever or whoever has become more important to you than your relationship to God. If there's something that's more important to you than your relationship with God, that's what Jerusalem and the temple were to the Jews. Jerusalem had become more important than God. The temple had become more important than God. So God, poof, he wiped it out. And some of you may have experienced something like that before in your life. I have where a job had become more important to me than, than my relationship with God. God's, boom, we're done with that. Oh, my gosh, you know, how can I live without that? And, and so even the guys, even the psalm that, that Danny was quoting today, how can we possibly sing when we know that Jerusalem is in ruins? Because, you see, Jerusalem had become more important than God. They could have said, we can sing because God is still on the throne. No matter what's happened in your life, no matter what horrific events have happened in your life, God is on the throne and he is 
working even in our pain for our good. Now, that's sometimes difficult to think about. And and for, for us to have that, we have to have a futuristic kind of look like tomorrow and the next day and the eternity is where God often is going to make his promises come true. Well, today, we're going to venture into chapter 33, and to prepare for chapter 33, we're going to read, this is interesting, John chapter 1. Now, you don't have to read, you don't have to go there. I'm going to put up on the screen, and Jeanette's going to do something with the lights. Uh, And and we're going to just read John 1 uh, together, and we're going to read it just silently on the screen here. And this is how we're going to begin today. I'm going to let you read it first, silent after a moment, and I'm going to read it and go to the next part. So everybody's going to read quietly. The light shines in the darkness, and the darkness has not overcome it. True light that gives light to everyone was coming into the world. He was in the world, and though the world was made through him, the world did not recognize him. He came to that which was his own, but his own did not receive him. Yet, to all those who did receive him, to those who believed in his name, he gave the right to become children of God. The Watchman. Today we're going to talk about the Watchman. There's a message that there are two paths light and darkness. You heard that. Life and death. Some choose darkness even when light. And life are available. They choose darkness and death. So God sent messengers to tell all of us about there's two options. Especially those who are choosing darkness. He said, hey, there's another option. It's light. First, John chapter 1 describes when God sent his son as one of those messengers. But Jesus wasn't the first messenger that God had sent. Before that, and after that, after the days of John, God has sent messengers and continues to send messengers. Some, like Ezekiel, were called watchmen. And so we're going to talk about the watchmen today. The watchmen. And we're going to do it from the perspective of Ezekiel's time. But remember, Zeke speaks not just back then, but also right now. So as you hear this, you're going to think, okay, how is this story that is a story from a long time ago, what relevance does that have to me? Any? Well, I think yes. So first of all, Ezekiel 33 tells us the job description of the watchman is this, do what I say. Boom. Pretty simple. Some of you have a boss at work. How many of you have a boss at work? How many of you are the boss? I love Kevin. He's the boss. Kevin has guys who work for him, right? And when Kevin says do something because he's the boss, he expects the guys who work for him to do it. And this is God and the watchman. God says, you're the watchman. Here's your job description. Do what I say. I'm going to tell you to do some stuff. You do what I say. You're the watchman. Now then, what does God say? This is what God says. Warn the people. 
the job of the watchman was to warn the people. Now, God, Ezekiel was God's specific watchman, but villages and towns and cities also had watchmen in those days. And the watchman had a job to warn the people for things that were coming. This was something, and, and if we were in a church like we are here today, and this was our village, let's say we were in a village, and we're in this village, we're going to look around and we say, who could be our watchman? Let's look around. Uh, well, he's not here right now, so that's important because to be the watchman, you need to show up. But that would be Noah. I would pick Noah for a watchman. But, but since he's not here, watchman number two is, I'm going to think, it's got to be kind of alert, somebody who kind of knows something, what's going on, and not distracted easily. I'm going to pick Danny. He's the watchman. But his job is, if you see a storm coming, you're going to tell everybody, hey, storm coming, okay? If you see an enemy coming to attack, hey, enemy coming to attack, get ready. Whatever it is, you know, if there's a wolf that's eating the sheep, uh, hey, wolf in the area, this is the job of the watchman. His job is to watch and then look. Now, then we also have some warning uh, signs and warning people and warning things in our culture today. Like, for instance, uh, the warning light on the dashboard. And a lot of times today, today's watchman words, warnings are also annoying, right? And how many of you have that light that comes on your dashboard? It comes on and it, you don't know why. It's just on. And you think, why is that on? Is my car going to blow up or what? And so you think, I should take it in. And they, you take it in, they tell you, oh, nothing's wrong. Oh, well, why did the light come on then? I hate when the light comes on and there's nothing wrong. Because then when the light comes on and I think nothing's wrong, then my engine's going to blow up. You know, this is annoying. Warning sometimes is annoying. One time, I'm, a, I'm the director of housing at ACU, and uh, so uh, all the dorms, the kids who live there, they come, and one of the things we have in dorms are fire alarms, and sometimes we have fire drills, and you know what's the most annoying thing is a fire drill, so it's so funny because kids want to say, well, you know, if, it was, if the alarm's going to go off, I at least wish there was a fire. I'm like, what kind of weirdo are you? But uh, a couple years ago, I mean, it wasn't even school hadn't even started. It was welcome week. So the freshman dorms are full. And this freshman girl's dorm is full of girls. And someone has a candle burning. You know? And then guess what happens? Alarm. Fire alarm. And the, all the girls have to leave. It's 2 o'clock in the morning. And they go outside. It's August. Thank goodness. It's not freezing cold. They go outside. They're in their pajamas, most of them. 2 o'clock in the morning. They're standing. It's about 200 girls. Standing out in front of the lawn, okay? And the fire department comes. Because the fire department is also alerted by the, by the alarm, by the, okay? Yeah. And so they come, and they can't figure out how to get the fire alarm off. So they think there must be something else burning. And so for about two hours, about 200 girls stood out on the lawn because a girl had lit. I mean, it's warning. Sometimes warning signals are just annoying. They bother, they bother you, and sometimes it's like this. Some other warnings, uh, I, I don't know if you've ever been to the doctor, and the doctor tells you something you don't like about yourself. And he says, you need to change that. And I'm like, but I like sugar a lot. And he says, yeah, but it doesn't like you. I'm like, okay, so what, are we going to have a negotiation here? He says, no, stop it. And so, so much of the time, a warning is this, this stop it thing. Or, or sometimes it's not a stop it, it's just a slow down. Because sometimes, as you know, I'm driving a lot. And sometimes the little sign on the side of the road to me seems like a suggestion rather than a law. And so I might be, not confessing anything, but I might be going a little too fast. And there's happened to me several times. And it's a, to me, it's like the protection of God. Uh, the officer comes, I'm going to give you a warning. I think, oh, th thank you, Jesus, and thank you, officer. But uh, 
But he says this too, but you got to slow down. And I'm thinking in my mind, but if I didn't need to be there fast, I wouldn't have been speeding in the first place. This is going on in my mind, you know. Sometimes warnings are annoying, but this is the job that God gave Ezekiel. You have to go warn the people. Now, there were some specific things about the warning and, and the watchman. The watchman had a job, and he was responsible for doing his job, but he wasn't responsible for the response of the people. So he said this very specifically. Here's the way it goes. You guys are doing bad things, and if you keep doing these bad things, you're going to die. Okay? And, And God says to the watchman, Ezekiel, he says, if you tell them that they're doing the bad things, and they continue to do the bad things, you're off the hook. You're not responsible for their continuing bad decisions. But if you don't tell them that they're going to die, if you don't do your job as watchmen, they're going to die still because it's their fault that they're doing the bad thing. But you're going to die too because you didn't tell them. Your job is to tell them. To give them a chance, to give them a chance to quit burning candles in their room, (laughs) to give them a chance to slow down on the highway, to give them a chance not to eat so much sugar. I would love, how would you love to have this kind of doctor? He sees your x-rays and he said, man, they're going to die if they keep living like they're living, but I'm not going to tell them because they'll be annoyed at me if I tell them that they shouldn't eat more sugar, right? You want that doctor? Kind of, but not really. I want the doctor who's going to really tell me what's wrong with me so I can really do something about it. Or at least least I have a choice, right? So it's like God's saying, Ezekiel, you need to tell them. If they don't pay attention to you, it's not your fault. It's their fault. Now, the warning was going to come in a couple of different points in the warning. Two parts primarily. First is, former good deeds do not excuse current bad actions. Okay, so for instance, if you grew up in the youth group, and let's pretend that today you're Maddie, and you grow up in the youth group, and you do everything right. You listen when you're supposed to listen. You sing when you're supposed to sing. You do everything helpful. You do the things that Bob asks you to do. You do the things your mom asks. You do everything great. But then as you get older, you decide that you're going to become a serial killer. But you're a very good one, and you never get caught until the watchman comes and says, Hey, Maddie, I I know you were a really great kid in youth group, but now you're a serial killer. You're going to die. You're going to go to the electric chair if you keep killing people. Stop it. Well, you might already have to go to the electric chair in that case. That's not a good example. But the but point is, you can't store up good deeds in the past and hope that those good deeds now excuse you for being a bad actor now. Does that make sense to you? You understand? Well, the other point is, former bad deeds also don't condemn a person who repents. So, okay, but what if I was instead I was Emily and I was a troublemaker in the youth group? And I went to sleep during the sermon. And and I didn't do what my mom and dad said. And I was just a wreck in the youth group. So now am I doomed? Is it over for me? And I would say, not if you wake up during the sermon. (laughs) Take notes. Stick yourself in the leg with a pen. You know, do something. So it comes down to what does this word repent mean? Because if you repent, the message of the watchman is, hey, uh, bad stuff is on its way. And the only way for you to escape the bad stuff is to repent. Well, what is that? Okay, repent means first, first is turn around. So you're, you're going a direction you know, in, in life. And, and repent means I stop, oh, turn around and go back. I'm going the wrong way. And I'm going to turn around and go the right way. Also, it means this, though. It means to return to your previous something. And specifically, path, home, or love. 
So you're on a path, and you're on the right path. And let's say, once again, I'm going to take, oh, Emily, because she's available. And I love it that she is, because in a minute, she's going to do a reprise of the great skit done last week. Okay? So uh, she's, she's on the right path to graduate from high school. Right? And you're going to graduate at a certain point. Right? But then she stops going to certain class. She doesn't stop going to all of her classes, just the one certain class. And so it seems like she's not totally given up. She's sort of, but she's not on the right path. All right? And you know how it is. If I was on a path walking, and I was walking from here, I was going to go out the door. I don't have to just turn around and go this direction to miss to be off the path, right? I could just be slightly off the path, just a little bit off the path, and I'm going this direction. I'm just not very far off the path, but I'm never going to get to the door if I keep going this direction. So the watchman says, repent, which means return to the path. And sometimes you may get off the path several times. Well, it also says return home. Another way this word is used is in Hebrew especially is to return home. To repent is to return home. This is what the prodigal son did. He had left home, and repenting for him means I'm going back home. That's me. I'm going to go back home. Or another way is to, to return to your true or your first love. This is the uh, church in Ephesus in Revelation. John says, you've lost, you've, you've left your first love. You've left your first love. The thing that was most important to you, you've got to go back to where your first love. In, in this case, it was the, the way they came to Jesus in the first place. That full-hearted coming to Jesus, yes, I'm all in. That's me. That's me. I love Jesus. I'm coming back to that. That's what it is to repent, to come back, to return. And so the watchman is saying, you guys, whew, you're in bad trouble Unless you repent. But if you do repent, things are going to be good for you and for your future. This is the job of the watchman. Now, right off the bat, I want to make two 2019 applications, okay? We're not yawning about what's going on back there in Jerusalem or really in Babylon right now. We're thinking about 2019 Arlington, Texas. Number one, are you receiving a warning that needs action on your part. I just want to ask you. I'm not asking you as a congregation right now. I'm asking you as an individual. I'm asking Leanne. I'm asking Michelle. I'm asking Joe. Is there something that the watchman, the Holy Spirit, is saying to you right now that needs action on your part? We're going to come back to that in a minute, but I want you to think about this. This is the message of the sermon today. Is there something in your life that needs to be addressed? This is a warning. Address it. Second, is there a warning that you need to speak to someone in your sphere of influence? I'm not suggesting that... You know, we get signs. This is what, you know, maybe Alan would have done back in his days. Uh, A big sign and say, turn or burn. You know, this is not what we're trying to do. You know, the end is coming. You're going to go to hell if you don't be like me. You know, this is not what we're talking about. But is there someone in your sphere of influence, someone you love, someone you know, that they are headed in the wrong direction? They've lost their first love, and they, you need to speak to them. Now, there's a difference between what I'm asking you to do and nagging, okay, and, or, or, or judging. And so I, I've had, this, is one, this is not the only way. Sometimes maybe you need to be a little more confrontational than this. Uh, but I read in Facebook this week a confession by one of our friends. And I'm going to read it to you because, after all, it was on social media. And and so if you don't want it on social media, if you don't want it to be read in church, don't put it on social media. (laughs) The way it goes. 
Here's what he wrote. Some of you will recognize this person. I didn't want to go to the gym. Like, I really didn't want to go. Does anybody know who this is so far? Okay, yeah. I outed him. I had long John Silvers for lunch. But my partner told me that she was going. She didn't make me go. She didn't remind me I ate crap like crap for lunch. And that's what it takes to make it. You have to surround yourself with positive, supportive people. Parentheses, watchmen. So remove the negativity and chase your dreams. In this case, Jennifer was a watchman, not by anything that she spoke out of her mouth, but by her actions. She showed, I'm going to do this, whether you do it or not, buddy, and didn't even have to say that, you know? It's just implied. I'm going to do this. I'm going to eat good. I'm going to work out. I'm going to do what I know is good. I'm going to do it. And what was the impact on Jeremy? Okay, I'll go. You know, I don't know what was inside of his heart, but inside of his body, something was turning. He's returning to the path. And, and isn't that so much more important? Okay, so mom and dad, we're, we're in this situation, and dad is sick, and I, we don't know what to do. Because he's having some heart, or I should say chest pains. Probably wasn't his heart, but chest pain. We don't know what's wrong. But we, we can't, should we call the ambulance? Should we take him to the hospital? What should we do? We don't know. And so this, this happened yesterday. So yesterday, we're at the house, and Mom and I were looking at each other. What should we do? I said, we got we to gotta go to the hospital. Because what are we going to do if, like, he's moaning in bed, which is not that big a deal for Dad. If you know Dad, he moans in bed, you know, a lot. And he's moaning in bed, and then 30 minutes later, we walk in, and the dude is dead. What are we going to do? We need to find out what's wrong. And so we need to do that for each other. Now, I'm not talking about going and sneaking around each other's business, but when you know someone is hurting, or for instance, in this place, if you know someone's gone, man, I miss you guys when you're gone. So sometimes I'm doing a little behind-the-scenes research so I don't, you know, just act like I'm all in your business, even though I might be. So, you know, I know what's going on usually when you're not here. Because I find out from your friends who tell me, and they said, they don't, we're tired of talking about Ezekiel. Okay, so, sorry. <laughs> Fair, whatever. But, you know, we need to take care of each other in this watchman kind of way. And if I know you need some help because you're messing up, I need to say something to you. Not in judgment or nagging, or maybe I don't need to say something. I just need to invite you to come with me. Or I just need to say, this is what I'm doing. How about you? Is there somebody who needs to hear from you? Because you're the watchman. I don't want to, I would hate to have gone back in mom and dad's bedroom and dad be on the bed, died of a heart attack because me and mom were too lazy, didn't want to butt into their afternoon of the people who were going to come take him to the doctor. You don't know what I'm talking about? I'd rather make a mistake that way then just keep my mouth shut and do nothing. Now, the watchman is not an easy role because it's calling you to care about somebody else, mostly to care. So back in, back in Jerusalem and uh, Babylon, and I, now is when I need my actors to come with me, uh, Georgie and Emily. Now, if you were here, you'll recognize this. If you weren't, I will explain it quickly. Come on up. Georgie's playing games on her phone. Okay, true story. I wish we could stop the video, but nevertheless, Mom will watch this later. So, true story. We're in the emergency room, and the doctor is asking Dad about his medicines, and he turns over to Mom, Patsy, what, what is this? What, what is it that I take? What's that medicine I take? 
And I look over at mom, and the doctor looks over at mom, and she's looking down at her phone. And I can see, no one else can see what's on her phone, but I can see she's playing a game on her phone. She said, what did you say? Okay. Okay. So back to the skit. Sorry, mom. I love you so much. Okay. We talked about the fall of Babylon and, I mean, excuse me, the fall of Jerusalem. And Emily's representing the people of God who are still in Jerusalem. Georgie's representing the exiles, okay? Now, when the fall of Jerusalem happened, boom, she died. Go, go, go down. <laughs> now, then, when she died last week, she kind of semi-died because she was sort of sitting up. Go ahead and sit up. Like that. That's enough. And she was mumbling something. But, but in reality, not everyone died. And Ezekiel 13 points to this fact. There were some people who were hidden like under the rubble. And some had escaped out of the city. And it talks about this. And they're out, outside in the country. And now then, they're getting back together. All the, all the Babylonian soldiers have gone. And now then, the, the people who had been exiled are gone. And the people who had been killed are gone. Now there's just a very few people left. And there's just very few people left, and that's representing Emily. And what they're saying to each other is, man, Abraham came, and he had this land all to himself, and it was awesome because it was not that many people. But lately, we had a whole bunch of other people, and now they're gone. They're either dead or they're, you know, this is how compassionate they were. They're dead, but now, so we can have all their stuff. We're going to go move into all their houses. We're going to plant, we're going to get all their farmland. We're going to get all the stuff that's left over. That's what they were saying. And God, God says to Ezekiel, say, no, 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 no. They're going to die. They're going to die from either disease, the wolves are going to, wild animals are going to come eat them. They're going to die because they have this unrepentant still heart. Their heart is still selfish. It's all about themselves. That's all they care about. They don't care about any relationship with me or any relationship with their brothers and sisters in exile. All they care about is themselves. And so they are going to die for real this time. But also, those people back in exile, they're sitting there thinking, whoo, we made it. But they're this special type. And we're going to read this together. It's on your handout. Number nine. All right, if you don't have your handout, you have to just pay attention to the screen. Because it happens to be on the screen, too. I forgot to hand out the handout. And I was going to talk about the handout. But here's, here's number eight. The survivors in Judah... That's Emily. They missed the point. They missed the whole point. But so did the exiles. So here's the way it is in the exiles. And if you would read with me, verse 31 is where it starts on your handout that now Jackie has. But, but verse 30 is where I'm going to start. It says, as for you, son of man, as for you, your people are together talking about you by the walls at the doors of the houses, saying to each other, come hear the message that has come from the Lord. So this is you guys, okay? This is you guys. You guys are sitting around talking about Bob. Went to the coffee shop. Steve's talking to his TCU friends, whoever it is you're talking. And you're saying, you know what? we got a pretty good preacher at our place. He does skits with the kids, you know. Sometimes he does videos or whatever. It's pretty good. You ought to come hear this guy. That's what's going on. And for Ezekiel, I mean, he was really, they loved his sermons because he would use like prostitutes and, you know, stuff like that. And then, whoa, wow, you can't believe what our preacher said in church. You ever been to a sermon like that where you went and you thought, oh, the preacher said something? Mm, no one ever says that in church. Yeah, that's what they were doing with Ezekiel. And so it's where your handout starts. My people come to you as they usually do, and they sit there before you to hear your words, but they do not put them into practice. Their mouths speak of love, but their hearts are greedy for unjust gain. Time out. I want to take a time out here. 
It's amazing to me in the book of Ezekiel, the sin that they talks about most of all is greed. It's just they're greedy. They're always, it's always about that. Whether it's the exiles, or I mean the people left in Judah who think they're going to get to take over now the land that these other, their neighbors have been gone. Now I can take my neighbor's stuff. Or it's the exiles. Anyway, just to me. Back to the handout. Indeed, to them, you, preacher Ezekiel, to them you are nothing more than one who sings love songs with a beautiful voice and plays an instrument well, for they hear your words, but they do not put them into practice. This is, this is the warning that I'm giving you. Back to those action, that act, those points, those, uh, what, I, what I call them there? Yeah, applications. Back to the application. Is there someone you need to speak to? Well, just don't sit here and, yeah, there probably is. Do it. Is there something that God is telling you to do or not? Do what he says. Okay, sermon, fine, but do what he says. Now then, one last story maybe. Nope, not today. Here's the thing. Today, even though we may hear that, y'all can go now, Emily, Georgie, thank you. Even though you're both in the skit, you're both really not paying attention to God. So we wish you would, there'll be a skit later where you do. We'll see what that looks like. Uh, for you guys, for, for our world, there's light in the world. The light has not overcome, I mean, the darkness has not overcome the light. The darkness can't overcome the light. Now, our choice, are we going to live in the light? Because we can. I want you to, these questions, uh, in my craziness, I sometimes think that a handout, that when I started having handouts, you know, when I first started coming to preach, I thought, this is what I used to think. I've learned better, but I used to think, you know what? People are going to take these handouts, and they're going to read them, and they're going to fill in the blanks, and they're going to take them home, and they're going to read over them again and study the Scriptures and think about that stuff. That may or may not happen, but these right here, these seven points, I think they're good. These are for us today. Application. What is a teaching you want to explore more thoroughly? I'm the watchman speaking to you. What's the Holy Spirit prompted you to do recently? What is some habit or activity that you need to stop? How is God leading you to redirect your resources? I mean by that your time and your, and your energy and maybe your money. What do you need to do less so that you can invest more into the advancement of the kingdom of God? Who is a person you need to forgive? And in what ways do you need to forgive yourself and move on into the present moment. Think about these things when you go home. Today, though, we're going to end singing the song, Shine, Jesus, Shine, because the light is still shining, more powerful than the darkness. And as watchmen, as watchmen for each other, I, I want us to sing the song like this is, this is who we are. We are these people who care and love each other And we won't mind saying so, okay? Let's stand and sing.